And that's why the vaxxers, the anti-vaxxers include security. All right, this is my big, big, big buddy. I'm not, don't mean it that way. The big buddy, Ben. Anyway, Ben Radford, the the scientific inve investigator person. I know. My speech is not that good yet, believe it or not. <laughs> I fake the rest of it, and it's a little, I'm mentally I'm a lot more tired than I think I am. Um, anyway, Ben's going to be doing us, giving us a, a good rundown of what he spent, what, how many, how long? Five years? Tracking down the chupacabra, who's only 15 years old. He can't even drink. <laughs> uh, how, can you be, how can you be scared of something that can't even drink? They have different laws down there. Oh. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Their laws don't apply to us. Anyway, he's going to tell us what his findings, after being out in places like Mexico for a long time, come to the conclusion, it's kind of fun. I, I went through it. It's fun. So watch. Have a blast. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Can everybody hear me in the back? Okay, I will, I will project it now as well as uh, using, the, using the lab here. Uh, do most of you know who I am or do I need to do an intro thing? Yes, no? Okay, all right, Ben, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I am managing editor of Skeptical Inquirer Science Magazine. Uh, this is where I hold up a copy that I don't have with me. I've um, been doing that for, God, uh, 10, 12 years now. I'm also a research fellow at the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, and I do investigations into things like this. Uh, El Chupacabra, Ghosts, Bigfoot. My previous book was on lake monsters, uh, and I actually have a, uh, a book coming out specifically on the Chupacabra from the University of New Mexico Press in um, March. It's their lead title. Uh, that being said, I am competing, it is UNM Press, I'm competing against, you know, like, uh, Albuquerque politics, 1917 to 1920. <laughs> so it's an academic press, so I think that as soon as they started, like, you wrote something on the Chupacabra? Ooh, we can use that. Yeah, because we're, the other, the other stuff isn't, uh, it's not riveting stuff, honestly. Good stuff, but, but not riveting. Anyway, I'm going to do a, uh, I'll, I'll sort of give you an encapsulation of, of my uh, five-year investigation into the Chupacabra. I do have a shorter, condensed version in my new book, Scientific Paranormal Investigation. I have a handful of these. Most of them I'm saving for people in my workshop on Saturday. There are a couple over the uh, psychop table. Uh, but again, the, the, the main, what, what always happens is that whenever I talk about the Chupacabra, there's always somebody who says, well, yeah, but what about this? I'm like, well... I don't have time to go into the whole thing. Uh, I'm happy to answer the question, but if you want the complete full details, that's what it is. So um, we'll start out by what is el chupacabra? Well, it means goat sucker in Spanish. Uh, let me just preface this by saying that when I was trying to find graphics for this, uh, this PowerPoint, I went to Google and I typed in goat sucker. Um, I will not soon forget some of the images that I saw. I sent some to Heidi. Uh, she, um, but anyway, uh, so yes, Chupacabra means goat sucker in Spanish. Uh, it is the world's third best known monster after, of course, Bigfoot and Nessie, the monster of Loch Ness. And much like Bigfoot, uh, it is not known for what it is because no one knows exactly what it is. Although, if anyone in the world does, I probably come the closest. But what it leaves behind, much like Bigfoot, uh, Bigfoot is you know it leaves big footprints uh, anywhere from 12 to 16 inches, depending on who faked it, um, <laughs> or or how big it was. I don't know. Take your pick. In the case of El Chupacabra, uh, it leaves behind dead animals. Uh, there's a couple right there. The the image on the left hand side is from Horizon City, Texas, a Chupacabra that was. Uh, made the news in January of this year. Uh, the image on the right is actually from a, um, uh, that's, the one on the right is, is a coyote attack uh, victim from a rear ranch, uh, excuse me, from a ranch in, in uh, Texas. Um, and typically it's, uh, they leave, you know, goat sucker, they leave behind uh, 
supposedly they're, they're left bloodless. This is a claim you see over and over again. This, uh, some farmer, someone else comes across a, a carcass. Usually, it's often goats. That's supposed to be their favorite, but also basically anything. Um, chickens, uh, cats, ducks, livestock, anything except humans, oddly enough, um, uh, ha has been claimed to be victims of the... There was a woman actually uh, in Texas a week or two back who said she was bit by one. I'm waiting to see the results of that one, but we'll see. The descriptions are interesting. Here, I, I've just selected a few. One of them is, uh, it was covered in glossy matted hair and has a feral face. Feral face. Its long limbs end in massive claws. The creature's powerful bat-like wings allow it to migrate huge distances. Goat suckers are deceptively small, standing just three to four feet high. This is from the Field Guide to North American Monsters. Not a great book, but it's, it's interesting when you're trying to uh, get a, when you're trying to corral different uh, descriptions. According to Mysterious Creatures, a Guide to Cryptozoology, which is actually a pretty good book. Um, I know the guy that wrote it, and it's a very meticulous uh, book. If you, in case you're interested in cryptozoology, it's an it's a expensive set, but it's, it's pretty good, actually. Height, four to five feet. Covered in short gray fur. It can change color. Interesting. Large round head, uh, huge uh, fire red eyes go up to the temples. Uh, the ears are smaller absent. There's two small nostrils, lipless mouth, uh, fangs, pointy spikes run from the head down to the spine. Now that's one of the, that's one of the characteristics, uh, characteristic uh, signatures of the chupacabra. Uh, for the most part, there are few, if any, other cryptids, uh, cryptozoological creatures that are supposed to have that. Muscular thin hind legs, uh, no tail, three, um, three clawed toes. In fact, what you find, it's a, it's a chupacameleon. Uh, it, it's remarkable the, the range in vari the, the variety of descriptions that you find. And this is actually the case uh, also with lake monsters. Uh, Joe Nickel and I wrote a book on lake monsters a couple years back. And over and over again, we would begin researching a particular lake monster, and the, the, the official description was, well, it's, you know, it's dark scaly, uh, has dark scales, it's this, it's that. And that is one description, but if you actually read the eyewitness accounts and you dig beyond just one or two references, you often find that there's, in fact, a wide vi variety of descriptions. Some people say it's 12 feet long, some people say it's 200 feet long. Some people say it's got ridges on the back, some people say it doesn't. Some people say that the head looks like a snake. Some people say it looks like a, a, a St. Bernard. Uh, and this is much the case with the Chupacabra. Depending on which book you read or which eyewitness you talk to, uh, it either has a powerful tail or no tail at all. Uh, it spends most of the time flying in the night skies or it doesn't have wings. I mean, it's kind of one or the other. Uh, it has three fingers on each toe hand or four or five or really the, the more you dig into these things you realize that these people are not all reporting the same thing. The spikes down the back, even though that's the most characteristic signature of the chupacabra, uh, even some, some eyewitnesses uh, uh, don't report that either. There are actually three different types of chupacabras. The, there's the Puerto Rican chupacabra, um, there's the American chupacabra, and by American I mean American in the in the geographical sense, encompassing South America, uh, Latin America, North America as well. And these sort of grab bag chupacabras. This is like, if you got nothing else, if it's weird, what could it be but a chupacabra? I, I, I get this all the time. We'll, we'll, we'll touch on some of those. Here is the original Puerto Rican chupacabra. This is the most famous image of a chupacabra uh, ever committed to paper. It was done by a man named Jorge Martin who was a Puerto Rican UFO researcher. I was going to use investigator, but he's, he's a writer. He, 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 he writes on UFOs. And interestingly enough, um, the chupacabra was actually very quickly co-opted by the UFO crowd. It was initially cited in, uh, in um, Puerto Rico in 1995. I'll talk about that. But almost immediately, the, the, the people that got a hold of the main chupacabra I witness were all UFO researchers and they sort of put their own spin on what she saw. Uh, she said it was uh, dark eyes going up to the temples, spreading around the sides, very much like the alien. Um, you got about four feet high, bipedal, thin arms and legs, three fingers on each toes, no uh, ears or nose, 
and of course the feathers or spikes dang going down the back. The main eyewitness uh, to, to this, she actually described it, at one point she said it was spikes, she, then she said it was feathers, and she said it was sort of feathery spikes. And in fact, for reasons that you'll, see, you'll soon see, that makes perfect sense, as odd as that may sound. So this is the uh, Puerto Rican chupacabra. Again, this is the most famous image. Um, there are a couple of varieties. That's my drawing there on the left based upon uh, the main eyewitness. Her name is Madeline Tolentino. And uh, she had her sighting, uh, again, in uh, the, the second week of August in 95. And actually, the, uh, the original sketch is actually less accurate than mine. Uh, I based mine, I went back to her original account. And when I interviewed her in Puerto Rico a couple months back, she said that, in fact, my drawing is the most accurate ever created of, of what she saw. On the right-hand side is, a, uh, is another chupacabra, sort of red eyes, claws. You can see some of the spikes coming down the back there. This is actually for a, uh, a sideshow banner, because where do you find chupacabras but in sideshows, right? Then, we, then there's a couple other ones. We have uh, this there's sort of lizard-like uh, chupacabra thing there in the back with the you know the little claws. Um, there's another rendition uh, attacking a goat, uh, again with the fangs and the characteristic claws. The, the one on the right looks more like maybe a, a canid or a jaguar or something like that. So as you can see, even, even given though that, that basic framework of descriptions, you have a wide variety of interpretations. Then we have the American chupacabra. Now, the Puerto Rican chupacabra was seen for about five years, give or take, between about 1995 to, to 2000, give or take. There was, there was some overlap, but for the most part, that was what was seen. There were, uh, there were people who saw it in... Um, it went from Puerto Rico to Mexico, uh, Brazil, um, uh, the south of Florida, uh, Chile, the Atacama Desert, places like that. And then after a while, that chupacabra sort of just disappeared. It wasn't seen anymore. People don't really see the original chupacabra anymore. Now they see this. This is, a, this is actually, this one is taken from a place called Blanco, Texas. Uh, a guy named Jerry Ayer found uh, this little, actually a friend of his, uh, he's a taxidermist. A friend of his saw this thing, poisoned it, uh, gave it to him. He's like, hey, uh, I found this weird uh, thing I poisoned in my barn. Do you want it? <laughs> it's like, shit, I guess. Uh, it might be chupacabra. Okay. So he took it, uh, and actually, he actually exchanged it in, in, uh, in, in exchange for um, taxidermy lessons. The guy has said, hey, t I'll give you this weird dead thing if you'll you know, teach me how to stuff goats. Like, okay. So um, what you find is that the American chupacabras, they are all in the family Canidae. That is, uh, they are, uh, it encompasses uh, foxes, dogs, coyotes, uh, wolves, <laughs> uh, things like that. They are usually hairless or nearly hairless. Uh, and there's reasons for that, sarcoptic mange being an obvious one, and of course they're quadrupeds. Uh, and uh, being, being cane as they would be. Here's a couple other ones, the, the one on the top left hand corner and also the one in the middle there. Uh, those were from the so-called Summer of the Chupacabra in Cuero, Texas. There's a woman named Phyllis Canyon, she's a little spark plug of a woman, about this tall, uh, she wears red visors. She's quite pleased with her red visors. She wore them every chance that she could. Uh, and she found the, the creature on the top left-hand corner there on her ranch uh, outside of Cuero, Texas. I was actually flown there. I'll talk about it a little bit later, but I, I interviewed her uh, at some length. The chupacabra on the top right-hand corner was uh, photographed only a few miles from my house. Uh, I live in, uh, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And someone saw that thing over on Coors Road and um, snapped a photo of it. Anything that's not the, the original Puerto Rican chupacabra or the American chupacabra. Uh, these are typically not uh, canids, uh, and nor, of course, they're the, uh, the, the spikes. Now, the difference between, between these, of course, is that in these cases, we actually have a dead body. That's what we're looking at, the dead bodies. In the case of the Puerto Rican chupacabra, no one's ever found them. Not a single one. No one's found their blood, their, their bones, anything else. Here we have the dead bodies, and then, of course, the question is, what are they really? And then you have weird things. And I'll, my, my next favorite is the, uh, this is also a chupacabra. 
Does he, any of you know what this is? It's a Jenny Hanover. Very good. A what? Ah, I dated Jenny Hanover. Uh, <laughs> Uh, no, Jenny, uh, Jenny Hanover is, uh, it's basically, it's also known as a devil fish. And it's basically a faked monster. Uh, it's a sort of creature that, for example, P.T. Barnum, uh, I, think he, I think he actually had one of these along with his P.G. Mermaid. And it's a, it's a faked monster. It's, um, these are sold in curio shops. I, got, I actually got this one in Puerto Rico. Uh, and they're very popular in the Caribbean. And yes, it's a dried, cut up skate. Uh, that normally we don't see things that look that weird, and it's because uh, you know, that's, this has been cut up and dried and formed to give, you know, see the eyes, the nose, the mouth there, uh, you know, there's a little tail coming around. You can make it look however you want. Um, in fact, this was, uh, an identical one was called, was, was, uh, was called a chupacabra uh, in uh, 2007. Uh, I was in Buffalo, New York. And a friend of mine emailed me, because, of course, people know what I do, so every time there's some weird shit on the news, I get a million emails. Uh, they're like, hey, they found Chupacabra in New Mexico. I'm like, cool, on the West Mesa, near where I live. So I looked at the photo. I'm like, that's not Chupacabra. I got one of those on my shelf. Hold on a second. No, no, it's still there. Um, so I, I, I contacted the, uh, the, the newspaper writer. I said, uh, don't mean to burst your bubble here. Uh, what you have a photograph of is not a chupacabra, it's, it's a Jenny Hanover, and I had to explain the whole thing. Meanwhile, of course, all the par pro-paranormal unexplained websites ran with it. They're like, oh my god, chupacabra found in New Mexico, blah, 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 this guy, the Fish and Wildlife Service, to give the guy credit, uh, he knew it was a skate, he didn't, he didn't know, not, know, not having a background in faked, <laughs> faked you know, skates, he didn't know that he didn't know what it actually was, but to give him credit, he, he said, "It's like I don't know what it is, but any chupacabra." So this is sort of the grab bag ones, um, and of course, it's not actually hard to find the chupacabra as long as you're not looking for the literal chupacabra. Uh, there are lots of chupacabra uh, bad horror films. I had to watch several of them to finish my book. Uh, there was not nearly enough nudity to make it worth my while. Um, <laughs> I do like special effects, I do like grade B movies, uh, but th there's some of them are awfully, awfully bad. Uh, and of course, we also have the Fantastic Four. Uh, this is a, a, a one-shot comic, uh, Los Cuatro Fantásticos. Uh, it's the, uh, the island, island of the Dead, and it's, uh, here you've got Sue Storm. This is perfect for this crowd. Got Sue Storm, oh, you all know this. Uh, Sue Storm, Ben Re Re Richards, and of course, there's Ben Grimm, the thing, saying, El Chupacabra. And I remember, wh remember when I was reading Fantastic Four in, in the, when I was a teenager, I never really pictured him yelling in Spanish, but I guess that makes, I guess it makes sense. But in this case, the chupacabra, was, it actually was a chupacabra in the story, and it was under command of the mole man. Just, I don't want to ruin it for you, but that's, that's what it was. Uh, and of course, we also have chupacabra models and a fetus. That is a, again, a fetus of a chupacabra. Um, I got the one on the right from, on eBay. You never know what you can find on eBay, chupacabra fetus, might as well. <laughs> uh, it's, as, it's as real as the next one. Um, and then we also have a chupacabra model there. Um, and we, we also, where do you find them? Sideshows. Uh, I'm happy to be an efficient out of sideshows and carnivals. Uh, I had to give up my lifelong dream of being a carny to, to do this chupacabra chasing stuff. Kind of regret it, but... Um, We've got uh, Chupacabra, here's the, here he is, of course, chasing the goat. There's a Mongolian death worm, which is another interesting cryptid which I could talk about later on if you're interested. Uh, and I sort of snuck in. You're not supposed to take photos in these things because, you know, this is the real Chupacabra. But I snuck in. I got a photo. That's what the real Chupacabra looks like yeah, after you pay your buck fifty. So I just saved you all a buck fifty. But if we're looking for the real thing, um, then we're kind of limited to, uh, we've got tracks, we've got footprints. Of course, what, what don't we have? Bones, bodies, spikes, scales, except, of course, for the American chupacabras, and I can talk about that later on. Uh, the, you know, the photograph on the left-hand side is from Cuero, Texas. Uh, she took a photo of that and said, oh, the chupacabra's back. Um, the woman in, in Cuero, uh, Phyllis Canyon, she actually said she found another batch of chupacabras. She, I think she's got like three or four in her freezer now. Um, uh, apparently they do, I don't know. They're, they're just the heads. 
Uh, the, uh, the, the print on the right hand side is from a chupacabra sighting in uh, Florida. Um, and of course we also have dead animals. Th that's the other of course signature. That's the way you know that the chupacabra's been there is because there's a dead animal around. Um, uh, and of course that, that's what, what you find is that when, when you're looking at uh, the chupacabra reports, actually most of them are not sightings of the chupacabra. They are somebody finds a dead animal and assumes, well, what could have killed it? Well, in fact, a number of things, but their assumption is the chupacabra. So when you see reports, well, you know, the chupacabra has been sighted hundreds of times, blah, blah, blah. Well, no. The chupacabra has been assumed to have been there a couple hundred times. It's been sighted, you know, a few dozen times, granted. But uh, it's important to make a distinction between someone reporting a sighting of the chupacabra and someone saying, uh, there's some dead things here. Uh, I'm thinking it's the chupacabra. Uh, here, again, this is Horizon City, Texas, in January. Uh, these are typical of what you find, but if you look a little more closely, um, there's something odd here, and I actually pointed this out to the, uh, the journalist, because um, uh, here's, the, here's the, the wound on the chicken. And again, what is the signature? The chupacabra is a vampire. Unlike, unlike any other unknown monster other than you know, a vampire, uh, unlike Bigfoot, unlike Nessie, unlike take your pick, the chupacabra is at its heart a vampire. It sucks blood. Well, in, in this case, uh, there's actually, you can see the blood. I mean, there's, there's no blood suck. There's, there's plenty of blood in there. And in fact, I, I asked the photographer, and I also contacted the, the, the person whose chickens were killed, a woman named Erica Garcia. I said, I'm, I'm just curious here. Um, you're pretty sure that, that the chupacabra killed your chickens. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, was there a blood missing? No, no, I don't think so. Like, well, because normally they kind of go together. It's like, well, I don't know, we just, something, something killed the birds. Okay, well, again, meanwhile, this is being reported as a chupacabra sighting. So I spent about five years investigating the chupacabra. I've heard some people wonder about my sanity and whether if it was really worthwhile. And then that's fine, I, I get that a lot. Uh, I interviewed dozens of witnesses, uh, chupacabra finders, experts on vampires, um, forensic medical examiners, coroners, etc. etc. Uh, went to Cuero, Texas, uh, where there's Phyllis Canyon right there. Uh, always happy to tell her story of finding uh, El Chupacabra in Cuero, Texas. There's uh, her dead head. And um, the head smells like you would expect a severed head to smell like. <laughs> Um, evil, uh, unpleasant, a little formaldehyde, -y, a little old spice, maybe. Uh, but just so that, in case someone wants to know what a chupacabra head smells like, it's very much like that. Um, and there's uh, these are the photographs that I took. I was actually flown out there for a TV show called Monster Quest, um, and uh, on the the show aired, I think, about a year ago. Much of the much of what I said was left on the editing floor, not to my surprise. Uh, I actually, I had met, I met with the producer on the, on the night of the shoot, we, I flew into San Antonio, and uh, I, uh, I called the producer and I said, he said, come on to my room, he wanted to go over the call times, okay, be here at 10 o'clock, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, and he was all wanting to know about, you know, getting this, the logistics together and the camera crew and this and that, I said, just take a deep breath, sit down for a second, let me explain the chupacabra to you because that's why you flew me here. That's, that's what this is about. He's like, okay, 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 j w w whatever. Okay, so, so I'm, I'm trying, well, this is, this is all, th these, are, these are the facts, this is how these things fit together. And it soon became clear that he was not interested in my story of solving the chupacabra. He had a script to stick to, and I hadn't written the script. And he wasn't a bad guy, he wasn't an evil guy, he just was a producer and he had a show to get out. And he didn't care <laughs> whether of what he was putting out there was accurate or not. Uh, and I did. And I'm trying to like, look, I'm, I, you know, I said, look, you can be the first person to really put this together. I've, I've been on other Chupacabra shows before. No one has really pieced this together in the right way. Do you want to do it? Well, oh, look at the time. I got I to gotta go drink. Uh, we'll be like that. So uh, whatever. I, you know, I've, I've dealt with these shows before. And uh, in fact, my next talk uh, is on... Um, is on behind the scenes of a ghost uh, invest uh, ghost TV show. So we'll, we'll, there's, there's lots of weird stories there. Anyway, um, so 
as long as I was there, for, well, they're going to fly me out there. I'll interview uh, her and, and smell her dead head. Did that. I went uh, to the Indian Maize jungle in Nicaragua. It's, um, it's near, near the, uh, the Costa Rican border. It's actually a place where Mark Twain uh, went through. Uh, and he, he wrote a short story about his, his adventures going through the area. Um, I spent about a week uh, tromping through the jungle uh, uh, looking for looking for the chupacabra. Uh, did I completely expect to find it? No, but uh, you don't know unless you look. And uh, I'm willing to go out there and actually look. That's one thing that distinguishes me from other people that write about these things, these monsters, uh, Bigfoot psychics, haunted houses. It's easy to sort of sit back and say, well, I, I don't think that's true, or that, that's bullshit. Well, it's a different thing to go there. And, and so and that, that's like one of the problems that, uh, for example, the ghost hunters, to use a different context, have with me, is that they can't just dismiss me as, well, he, he's never gone out and doing investigations. Well, actually, I have. So you know, don't, don't sit there and just try to brush me off because I haven't done it, because I have done it. And I know, and I can explain why, why a lot of what they're doing is wrong. And so that's why it was important to me to go to Nicaragua to make, make a sincere attempt to try and find it. You don't know if you don't look. And in fact, this, this particular area was, as far as I could tell, the most likely place to find an extant population of chupacabras. Uh, it is remote. Uh, there were chupacabra sightings in, uh, there's actually a very, very famous sighting in uh, Malpaiso, Nicaragua, um, found by a man named Jorge Talavera. Uh, and uh, chupacabra were supposed to have come from the Puerto Rican jungle. This is the jungle. It, it seems like if these things existed, they're much more likely to be found there than in the, in the deserts. So anyway, I, I went there. Uh, there's me with a local guide uh, looking for chupa tracks. Um, didn't find anything. Zero chupacabras, two vampire bats, and 100 huge ass bugs <laughs> uh, is what I found. Um, yeah, there, there's a vampire bat that was uh, sleeping above us in, in, the, in the tent there. I just, yeah, I couldn't get over the size of the ants there. That was just, uh, yeah. Anyway, again, zero chupacabras, lots of big ass bugs. So in case you ever go there, that's what you're going to find. I then went to uh, Canovanas, Puerto Rico uh, to interview the original chupacabra uh, eyewitness. I mentioned her earlier, Madeline Tolentino. That's her there on the left. And she is by far the most original, she's original and she's by far the most important chupacabra witness ever because it was her sighting. You know, remember the, remember the, uh, the spiky haired back, you know, weird alien looking thing? That came from her and just about only her. And the reason that her description of the chupacabra is so widely known is because as soon as, as, soon as she told other people, someone sketched it out, put it on the internet, Hey, 1995 internet, everyone's seen it. This is the chupacabra. This is what's been cited. And it became the standard image of the, of the monster. And um, I finally tracked her down. And again, this is 15 years ago. And almost nobody had actually talked to her since then. It was, it was kind of odd. I, I looked for, for interview, interviews with her, photographs of her, nothing, absolutely nothing. So a friend of mine found her on Facebook, actually her ex-husband. <laughs> Um, he's a very cooperative guy, and, uh, and it all worked out well. I uh, interviewed her, and I uh, went down there, and I and, uh, met her to Borders, um, and very busy Borders, and I asked her her story again. And she actually gave me some interesting, uh, interesting eyewitnesses. I'll, I'll very briefly encapsulate her sighting, but there she is with uh, her, her ex-husband there. That's the creature, essentially, that she, that she saw. This is where she saw it, uh, that this wall wasn't there at the time. Uh, but uh, this, is, this is the road where she saw the chupacabra. Uh, she said that it was uh, standing just outside her window. And she looked down at it, uh, and she got this incredibly detailed description of it, uh, which is why you know, there, there are so many aspects to it, including, oddly enough, that um, it had no anus. I did not know that. <laughs> I find it odd. I'm skeptical, but I find it odd that, that she was such a, a, a <laughs> had such a magnificent powers of observation that she knows the lack of an anus <laughs> on a chupacabra. Hey, what about, anyway, what was my story? So she says that uh, she saw it, she sort of jumped around, and then it went into the road, uh, and then it, it sort of flew off. Uh, actually, there was, a, 
there's a, uh, a vacant lot. Uh, that house, actually the house just on this side here, it, it, it was a vacant lot at the time. It was overgrown with weeds, and she said it sort of basically jumped into the weeds and was gone. There's now a house there, although on the other side of the house you could see the tall weeds. So that was essentially her story. Um, and when I re-interviewed her, she stuck to her story significantly. There were a couple important differences, and I won't bother to go into it now. I'll save, some, I'll save that for Q&A if you want. But uh, so I interviewed her at length. The first person, as far as I could tell, ever to have actually talked to her outside of the, the, the UFO researchers in 95. Also went to the Arecibo Radio Observatory, just because I could in its goal. Uh, um, you know, Carl Sagan said he, you know, I was digging that. And also the El Yunque Rainforest, uh, which is, according to many people, supposed to be the, or the, the, the birthplace of the Chupacabra. Uh, it's, uh, that's, that's where people think it came from. It's, it's actually not too far from Canovanus, where, where she, uh, where she current, well, still lives and where she lived at the time. So, um, so again, traveled lots of places trying to piece together the different parts of this mystery. And it had been around since, uh, again, since 1995. There are some people that claim that Chupacabra actually dates back earlier. It doesn't, and I can, I can explain that if anyone has any questions on it. But basically, uh, I pieced together all the different parts of it except the most important part, which is, where the hell did it come from? Wh what is this thing? Um, and that was... Uh, that's what it was, and, and di some people thought it was, uh, uh, some people think that the Chupacabra is a, um, it's an alien, some people think that it is, um, it is a, a, the result of a top secret genetic experiment gone wrong, sort of a Frankenstein thing going on. Uh, some people think that the Chupacabra is a sign of the apocalypse. There's, a, there's at least a couple, a couple Roman Catholic and, and, uh, and Pentecostals who are convinced that the fact that Chupacabra exists exist. Uh, huh? Is it the Mayan No, no. It's, uh, they, they, they say, well, at least one person has said that, that uh, in the book of Revelation mentions the Chupacabra. <laughs> Oddly enough, I, didn't, I must have missed that. But, um, but, uh, but again, I kept coming back to this stone wall of where did it come from? It must have come from somewhere. Um, and why did it appear suddenly in Puerto Rico in August of, of 1995? Because real creatures don't do this. Giraffes don't suddenly appear in St. Louis in 1982. You know, uh, bears didn't suddenly show up in Australia in 1948. This just does not happen. So if this is a real creature, then it has to have come from somewhere. And so this was sort of, I was, I'd, I'd pieced together almost all the parts of it except this one, the origin, it was just, it was just pissing me off because I couldn't, I couldn't nail down where it came from, and I figured that, that in order to really claim that the mystery had been solved and that, that really to piece it together, I had to be able to provide an answer to that. So I spent a long time trying to figure out what might have shown up in Puerto Rico, in San Juan specifically, um, in the months before the original sighting in August of, of 1995. There was a dengue fever outbreak. There was Her Hurricane Hugo. Uh, there were a variety of things that appeared before all this happened. And uh, finally, uh, I found a new element that had come to the island just before the original sighting, before the Chupacabra became nationally known, um, that could have spawned the sightings. And I realized that the Chupacabra, the, the, the creature that she described, bears no resemblance to any known animals. There are no bipedal animals that have the sort of alien-esque head and the spikes on the back. Uh, there's nothing that looks like that, except, except something in the movie Species. Now, the name of the creature in the movie Species is Sill. It was created by H.R. Giger. That's him there looking constipated or pissed off or something. <laughs> or, glowering into the camera as, as, you know, tumultuous artists are supposed to do. Uh, and there, there's H.R. Giger himself. And he's probably best known for uh, doing these, these sort of, you know, gothic, arcane, scary, you know, he, everything from Lovecraft to uh, aliens, satanic things. He's probably best known for crafting the uh, species, the, the figure uh, Alien. In fact, he won an Academy Award for his creature design for this film.
which is one, which is the main reason he was actually tapped for, for the species zone. And um, this is in, in the film. He's actually there's a there's there's the monstrous form, and there's the of course more attractive, uh, you know, lovely tall supermodel Canadian supermodel form. Uh, there she is in human form. I just thought I would uh, throw that in there. Um, <laughs> but what's interesting is when you when you when you look at the sill creature and the chupacabra side by side, there's a remarkable, I would say, <laughs> not surprising coincidence once you once you understand the context here. There on the left is the creature, more or less. It's it's actually changed since then with with a couple new de new details that she gave me, including by the way, that uh, the creature uh, has five fingers. The, the monster, the, the the creature that she saw has five fingers, not three. Uh, I had based that on her original description, but it's since been revised, and so if I'm going to redo it, it would have five fingers. Um, but you can see a couple interesting things here. Um, Here's, a, here's some uh, stills from the film. This is actually a, a model, and there's a still from the film there. And you see, for example, the, uh, the spikes. And uh, I don't know if there's a good shot in here. Actually, you can kind of see it. The spikes, what do they kind of look like? Feathers. The spikes, and there's, there's even Im better images of that. The spikes, look they, they, have, they have veins in them, just like a feather does. Which is interesting because remember the, the, the very, very specific detail that Madeline Tolentino said about the chupacabra, it has spikes or feathers or feathery spikes. This has <laughs> feathery spikes. You have, you have the, uh, the, the, uh, the upshot eyes, you know, the sort of alien-esque eyes, the darker black image, uh, eye, eye sockets. Um, and uh, you've got the wraparound eyes, the elongated head, the tiny or non-existent nose. Long fingers, spikes or uh, feathers down the back. Long thin arms, long thin legs, missing ears, bipedal, small mouth. Now, recognize that that there's a wide variety of creatures in the world. Everything from snakes to kangaroos to crustaceans. Take your pick. Out of all the possible, all out of possible biological forms that she might have come up with this, isn't it odd that it happens to look exactly like Sill? It, it gets even more interesting because, and if, if, probably with this crowd, probably more familiar with, with the sci-fi than, than other folks, but again, the two main explanations for the chupacabra are that it's either an alien or it's the, the result of top secret genetic experiments uh, uh, done, uh, done actually in the jungles of, of El Yunque. In the film Species, the sill creature is both an extraterrestrial alien and the product of top secret U.S. government genetic experiments in the jungle. And, and, and it gets even better because the very first scene in the Species is of the Arecibo Radio Observatory in Puerto Rico. I find this curious. Uh, it could be a coincidence. I will grant you that. Uh, I don't think it is. Uh, I, I think that this is not a secret. Uh, there are amazing similarities between the monster uh, that, that, that Tolentino saw, again, just outside of, of um, outside of uh, Canova, Venice. And the question became, could she have seen species and confused fact with fiction? Could she have seen this monster movie and said, hey, I saw a monster and, 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 and confused it with a witness account? And the answer is yes. Species was released on July 7th, 95, which was just as the chupacabra hysteria peaked and less than one month before she had her sighting. Now, it's important to recognize that, that she did not create the chupacabra in and of itself. There had been a pre-existing belief in Puerto Rico that something some animal, entity, creature, something had been attacking animals. That was not new. That was pre-existing. People already thought something weird was going on. But before her sighting, no one had seen it. No one had a description. It was a, it was a phantom. It was a shadow. Nobody had, nobody, no one knew what the hell it was. Uh, and I dug up an interview with Madeline Tolentino in a book called Chupacabras and Other Mysteries by Scott Corrales. 
Uh, and in there, she says, she saw a movie called Species. Okay, there's a clue. Uh, the monster made my hair stand on end. It was a creature that looked like the chupacabra <laughs> with spines on its back and all. The resemblance to the chupacabra was really impressive. Direct quote. I watched the movie and wondered, my God, how can they make a, the movie like that when things like this are happening in Puerto Rico? Now, this interview took place in 1996, about, I think, three or four months after, after the whole Chupacabra thing. So when she says, when, when things are happening in Puerto Rico, she means at the time. She's talking about late 1995, early 1996. This is not 20 years later. This is at the time. Um, and that's what it was. Uh, and I, actually, it, at first, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story, get a little bit of time. At first, I was concerned that she might have seen a DVD. That, this was my concern when I, when I found this. I'm like, ooh, ooh, I got it, I got it, I got a smoking gun. But then I said, well, hold on. What if she saw, well, it, it would have been a VHS at the time, not DVD, because it would have been 1995. So I was concerned I had a hole in my theory, my beautiful, beautiful chupacabra theory. Uh, and I was concerned, like, oh my God, because well, if she saw, if she saw the, the creature first and then saw the movie, then this don't work. It, it, it's not, it doesn't hold together. Uh, and then I, then I did some research and I found out that in fact, um, Species was not released on VHS until uh, later in 1996 after the interview was conducted. So she must have seen it before then. In fact, when I interviewed her in, in Puerto Rico, I asked her that. That is why the Puerto Rico first appeared in August of 1995. That is why it has spikes or feathery spikes or feathers, everything else like that. That is why it looks exactly like, almost exactly, not exactly, but almost exactly like um, the chupacabra. And that's why the origin stories are identical. She saw it in a movie. All the pieces fit together. Um, so for 15 years, after, again, this has been going on for 15 years now. And um, as it turns out, which is just this bizarre circle. You know, the original and most complete and best eyewitness of the Chupacabra came from a sci-fi horror monster <laughs> designed by H.R. Giger. Now, what's, what's curious is that you now have films about the Chupacabra, again, mostly grade B, you know, horror films, that are being based upon Tolent fictional horror films that are being based upon Tolentino's supposedly accurate, real, first-hand eyewitness account which was in turn based upon H.R. Giger's film, set to creature design for the movie Species, which was of course influenced by his work in Alien. Uh, it's this, sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. You have this, this beautiful circular thing uh, where you've got, let me go, see so you have fiction influencing fact, influencing fiction, and then, and then back again. Um, so again, that's the nutshell of the origin part. <laughs> Uh, look, for, look for my book. Uh, I have, I have, a, I have a, a big book uh, coming at the 65,000 words on this damn thing uh, coming out in, um, in March of uh, next year from the University of New Mexico Press. There I am. There's the Chupacabra Slayer. Uh, there's a little goat saying thank you on the back of it. <laughs> and everyone keeps wanting to know who the blonde is with the, uh, I, I don't know. That was, but anyway. Um, in a nutshell, I'd, I'd be happy to take questions, comments, criticisms on the chupacabras or uh, any other manner of weirdness. So, well, I, the mics, they can record it. Oh, and I have, I have, just for fun, there, I, there's probably enough people here, I'll, I'll hand them out. If you don't want one, uh, pass it along. I have here um, trading cards from the movie Species. <laughs> so you can, Feel free to tell you there's the, there's the title of my book on the back. So anyway. uh, Did that lady come up with the name Chupacabra? Did and who? That, uh, the witness in Puerto Rico? No, no, in fact. And, and also, what's the origin of the, that, and how old is that previous uh, lore about a monster? Okay, two parts to that. Uh, th and, that and, and that's an important distinction to make because if you say Madeline Tolentino was the first person to see the Chupacabra, that's only kind of true. She never said it was the chupacabra. Other people said, oh, you must have seen the chupacabra. So, so this is, 
you know, it's important. I mean, you know, when she saw it, she didn't say, oh, that must be the chupacabra. She said, it's this weird thing. I don't know what it is. Um, and so it was other people that, that, that put that label onto her experience. And, in, and, and again, many of the people that did this originally were UFO investigators. They were not skeptics. They weren't scientists. They weren't even good investigators at all. I mean, I, it turns out, no, it, it, it's amazing. I mean, the, the, the lack of investigation conducted by these people is shocking. I mean, I've, see, I've seen more work put into missing pets. Uh, you know, I mean, they, they, they didn't interview Tolentino's mother who was there. They didn't interview, I just, <laughs> like, really? Um, so that, that's part of it. The other answer to the question was, um, what was the second? Yeah, the, the, now the, the chupacabra, do you want me to stand up here, up there, can you all, here, let me, let me get up top just to, typically what you find is that the, the chupacabra uh, is said to date back to, the story of, it's called the Vampire of Mocha, M-O-C-A, uh, and Mocha is a small town uh, on the western edge of, of Puerto Rico, and there was, uh, there were some sightings in the mid-70s, actually the mid-late 70s, of the vampire of Mocha, and they were basically mis mutilated missing animal type things. I actually tracked down an even better, uh, y if you can accept the vampire of Mocha as a predecessor to the Chupacabra, and there's a long laundry list of reasons why you shouldn't, and I can go into that, but if you're going to accept that, then in fact you would need to accept the, um, the identical sightings that I found that happened in Nebraska in like 1974. I mean, if, you're, if, you, if you really want to go that route, we can go to these other mysteriously mutilated animals that, that in fact, we know were not mysteriously mutilated. So typically, if you hear someone saying, oh, no, no, the chupacabra dates back earlier, it doesn't actually, and they're trying to rope in. It, it, and it's the same way with, uh, with uh, like, Bigfoot. Um, you know, well, people will say, well, you know, the Indians knew Bigfoot as blah, blah, blah. You're talking about two different things. This is, you know, you, your stories of the wild men in the woods are not the same thing as your eyewitness accounts of Bigfoot in, in you know, in 1967 uh, Bluff Creek. They're simply not. So that's part of the answer. Yeah. Uh, just a couple points. Mm -hmm. It is your conclusion that the North American chupacabra, so-called, is really just some form of canid. Yeah. The 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 the, the, the American chupacabra is your meaning. Yeah. What you find is that um, that. Again, in the case of the American chupacabras, we have bodies. This is not... <laughs> well, has we actual testing been done on Oh, them, absolutely, sure. Uh, and what you find is that, for example, in the, in the Cuero, Texas case, uh, it was, it, the answer came back, it was a coyote. DNA tests show it's a coyote. I interviewed people that did DNA tests on chupacabras. Uh, coyote with mange, sarcoptic mange, makes most of the hair fall off, except for a characteristic strip along the back and the spine. If you look closely at Phyllis Canyon's original photograph, you can see a characteristic strip of fur on the back of the spine, exactly as you would expect. Now, what they say, well, you know, a rancher or a, a farmer would recognize, you know, a, a coyote with mange. Not necessarily, no. Uh, and the same thing happens with, with the alleged, um, the, um, the, the blood drainage. Uh, people say, well, you know, a, a, reg a rancher would recognize it was killed by a coyote or dog because, you know, they, they, they kill their, their prey and take them away. No, they don't, actually. If, if you talk to wildlife experts in predation, they don't. Sometimes they do, but they don't always. And so, so if, you if you just come across a, a dead animal, in fact, um, uh, Dan Loxon, a friend of mine who was here on, this, on the thing earlier, uh, I interviewed him because he used to be a shepherd uh, in British Columbia. And he's like, yeah, I mean, I've, I've seen... Uh, dogs and coyotes will attack animals, they'll bite them on the neck, and they'll leave them for dead. And they'll, they'll die then and there, and the only sign of attack are two, two bloody holes in the neck. And they're not eaten, they're not, their blood isn't drained, but it, it looks very mysterious. All right, now, you said the chupacabra doesn't exist before 95, but it sounds like there were, there's basically a faceless rumor before yes. then, a rancher's myth ba to explain away dead animals? Yeah, well, what I tie it to is, um, I actually tie it to, to the European vampire. Uh, if, if you look at vampire stories from, for example, uh, Eastern Europe from the 1700s, 1800s, uh, you find stories where there are, there, bad things happen to crops. My animal is dead. What's going on? And they will attribute it to vampires. In fact, they did attribute it to vampires oftentimes. Uh, and you see, you see that same, the same vampire motif, the draining of blood, the draining of bodily substances, transported 
uh, to, to, to Puerto Rico. In fact, uh, in, in my book, I, I also compare it to stories of African vampires uh, and, and Latin American vampires. For example, there's, a, um, there's an entity called the Likichiri, uh, which is uh, known uh, among the, um, the Aymara in, in the, the Andes in, the, in South America. And this is a creature that will actually steal your fat. It will attack you at <laughs> night. Well, you know. And what's so bad about that? Well, <laughs> what, what's bad about that is that in the Andes, of course, it's very cold. And ah. fat keeps you warm. It keeps you protected. Uh, so again, I, I, I tie in uh, the vampire stories and motifs from, from, from Latin America, from Africa. And there's also a, a whole bunch of sociocultural stuff regarding Puerto Rico and it's their, you know, the fact that it's not a state. And there's a lots of anti-American sentiment wrapped up in all this. Um, I don't know if that answered your question, but... Yeah, I think so. Okay. The death worm? The Mongolian <laughs> death worm. Well, that was my question. Do you want to know about the Mongolian death worm? Is that... Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Tell about my what? Mm. You want to see my death worm, don't you? Yeah, all right. See me later. Yeah, okay, uh, a little bit on the Mongolian death worm. Well, the Mongolian death worm uh, was uh, the most recent expedition that I know of was, was conducted uh, three or four years ago by an acquaintance of mine named John Downs of the uh, Center for Fordian Zoology. Uh, he's a large, weird-looking, rotund fellow with a cane. Uh, who he's British, so he's they love their ex ex eccentrics, and I guess we all do here, you know. Uh, but I ran into him um, at what's called the Fortean Times Unconvention in London. He was giving a talk on this, and he and a couple of friends had gone to Mongolia. Where else are you going to find the Mongolian death worm? I mean, duh, it says it right in the name. And the story goes that there are these. It's almost like the movie Tremors, you know, where you have the, sort of like that. Um, they are said, uh, they're, they're said to uh, spit acid sometimes. They're also said to kill with electricity. They'll zap you. Um, and what you typically find is that these, I haven't personally investigated, I haven't, you know, I'm, I'm busy with the chupacabra right now. I'll get to it as soon as I can. Um, but, uh, but, but from what I read on it and the, the investigations, they've gone out there, they haven't found anything that, that, that you know, resembles a large, wormish thing that spits acid or, or electricity. Uh, some people believe that, uh, it's, that the story of the death worm is basically a folklore um, entity, folkloric entity that sort of was confused originally with, uh, with creatures in the Mongolian desert that in fact can sting you. Um, maybe it was as well. I, I, it could be, yeah, tremors. Uh, it would be interesting to find out when, when, the, when the rise of that is. But, so. Any other questions on chupacabras or mysterious creatures or any other, any other weirdness? And, and does, does anybody, um, yeah, to be honest with you, you are the first crowd that I have actually revealed my, my, um, my analysis on, on the species thing, other than, of course, in the book. So uh, if there are holes in my theory or you think it's bullshit, feel free to say so, because I'm, I'm happy to, uh, I'm happy to. Uh, you do, that doesn't look like me? Well, take, take off your shirt, we'll find out. <laughs> well, the tattoo is right. But, uh, <laughs> so anyway, um, well, cool. Well, I appreciate you all listening to the thing. And, uh, and just uh, all I can say is that, is that uh, we have a question here. All I can say is that what's fascinating to me is that, again, for a monster that's been around for 15 years, and in a way, I'm almost insulted that it took me to figure out the, the species connection. I mean, because I mean, I'm not the brightest guy on earth. I mean, I, I've done this for a while. I know what I'm doing. But, but it's like, it, it just seems odd to me that for something that is so well known around the world, uh, and you and you sort of once 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 you put the pieces together, I say, well, species, sill, monster, that's where she got it. Now, did she make it up? Was she lying? And that's your question now. Yeah, yeah the, the, the argument's compelling. It makes a tremendous amount of sense, and obviously the missing pieces are probably covered in the book because you're. Yeah, I mean, again, the, well, yeah, there's a lot to it. I mean, in the case of Tolentino, um, you know, I don't think she's lying. I mean, most people that I deal with, whether they're, they are, they're eyewitnesses for ghosts, monsters, whatever else, they're sincere people. They're mm -hmm. not crazy. They're not stupid. They're just... My question um, is, is there someone where you go, where I would go from here, if mm -hmm. I would be so bold, is 
to have someone try to form some objective opinion as to what was going on inside of her mind. I mean, I could come right. up with two or three right. logical things on the surface, like people tend, when they see something they don't understand, their brain tends to focus it into something that they right. recognize, stuff like that. It'd be interesting, and I was wondering if someone had done it, to try to figure out what... <laughs> to some degree, yeah. Yeah, I mean, again, ultimately, uh, short of a confession, there's no way to know. Right. I mean, I wasn't there. There's no videotape. There was no other, no other real eyewitnesses. Um, I think that she, she had seen, she had just seen the movie Species. She saw this monster, and uh, you know, was she sleeping? Was she hallucinating? I don't know. I can tell you that um, that there have been other cases where people have reported seeing in real life. They're like, I saw this and it's later been traced to a film. And it's like, you did not see this. I'm sorry, you saw it on the screen. So you didn't see this in your backyard. The other right. part was, and I don't know if I missed it in the explanation or, or what, mm -hmm. what I didn't hear you say was that someone found a dead animal after she saw the chupacup. No one's ever found anything remotely resembling I that. I find the, that the, the only, fascinating. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah, it is fascinating, and in fact, uh, and hers was, it wasn't the only description on those lines, but it was certainly one of the very few. And there is evidence, there's strong evidence, that, that the other reports that were similar to hers were influenced by hers. They said, I heard about her report, it was kind of like hers. So they're like, they're basing their sighting on what she said. It's like, yeah, what she said, plus, you know, it had a ring. Clearly it was E.T. Thank you, sir. Right, <laughs> clearly it was E.T., yes. Hey, uh, this is... I guess sort of speculative, but what would you think would create the multiple types? Specifically, since her description pretty much solidified the supposed form of the creature, why do people suddenly start calling mangy coyotes the chupacabra? Yeah, the, the, the question was, why do people suddenly start ma seeing mangy coyotes as a chupacabra? And the answer is, uh, it's, a, it's actually the same answer with the grab bag chupacabras. Mm -hmm. Because, again, people don't know what a chupacabra is. Mm -hmm. We don't know. We don't have one to test. So what happens is that the word chupacabra mm -hmm. becomes a label for weird shit <laughs> or weird hairless thing that I found or it's, it's anything that people can't explain. And if it's a, if it's a dead animal, well, think about this for a second. If you know about the chupacabra, and it's, it's known worldwide at this point, I mean, it, everyone, not everybody believes in it. A lot of people do, but just everybody knows about it. If you find a dead, weird, hairless animal, it's not Nessie. It's not Bigfoot. You don't know what it is. It, it's, it's logical. It's kind of logical to say, well, it, maybe it's Chupacabra. And so that's, and that's immediately the thing. And that, in fact, when I, when I do my investigations, one of the very first things I ask is, who said it was a Chupacabra? Where did you get that? I said, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm not challenging you. I'm just asking you, you know, you find something dead. Where did the word Chupacabra enter into it? And usually the answer is, there was a Hispanic or Spanish-speaking ranch hand who said, hey, it's Chupacabra. And I, well, OK, uh, they, they must know what it is. It's Chupacabra. So right. The, that's the what only thing that struck me as odd about that is I don't think you would get somebody, granted, everything else but the Chupacabra is older, I don't think you would get somebody deciding that you know, dead animals that weren't Bigfoot-shaped were Bigfoot. Right. But someone has decided that something that departs from the, the chupacabra shape. They're, yeah, they're going to call it whatever they want to. So, Anyway, again, thank you all for coming out. Um,